Let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be reading to verses 10 and 11. Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The word suffering in the original language is actually in the plural as we have it in the New American Standard. Speaking of the suffering of our Lord, we would then see that those sufferings were many throughout his life. In other words, his suffering was not limited to the agony of the death on the cross. He suffered throughout his lifetime. Now this passage of scripture sets before us a neglected Christian duty. And that Christian duty has to do with the fellowship of his suffering. We speak a lot about fellowship. Christian fellowship is wonderful. We look forward to it. I anticipate being here on the Lord's Day and seeing your faces, shaking your hands. And find out how things are going. And the recent visit that we had with Justin this is an element that is drastically missing in his life. And he knows that because he was here. And uh, it was yesterday or day before that I, I was texting with him about the possibility of our canceling our service because of the weather. And he said, oh, I hope not. He says, because I know what a great thing it is for your people to be together. And he says, it was so wonderful to be there in, in your church. So fellowship, but there are other areas of fellowship that we need to explore and learn and apply. He uses the present tense in the speaking of these sufferings. Because it is a ongoing present experience in our life. It's not just one time been there, done that. So now what's next? No, there is a extending of our fellowship with Christ and particularly in the area of his sufferings and being conformed to his death. Paul wants to know him. Paul wants to know more regarding the resurrection. Paul wants to know more of the fellowship of his sufferings. 
And each of these speak of being conformed to the death of Christ. Let me state it this way. Unless the believer experiences what it is to be conformed to the death of Christ, he will not ever really truly know Christ. In other words, he will not experience in his daily life the power of the resurrection. That's what we're getting at. In other words, as I get up and go about my duties for the day, as I drive to wherever I'm going and back home, and the routine life that I have, unless I'm able to experience something in those outworkings of my life, the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, I'm missing some vital aspect of the reality of the Christian life. What I'm hoping to convey here is that there is such a thing of entering into the actual fellowship of the sufferings of Christ. Now, let's think a moment about the word no. We know that the word no carries a deeper meaning, a broad meaning. And when we say, I know someone, what, do we, what are we conveying? Just a superficial knowledge. I met him, spoke briefly with him, and on that basis I said, yeah, I know him. But do you really know him? Do you know how he thinks? I'm talking about an individual that you might meet at this point. How much did you know, did you learn in that brief encounter that you had? Maybe you picked up a few facts, where he works, where he lives, how many children he has. Those are facts about the person you just had the encounter with. So depending on how much facts you gathered might determine how about you know him? But on the other hand, if you have had the opportunity to sit down and talk with this person beyond a 15-minute encounter, you're going to get better acquainted. And suppose you have lunch several times you're getting better acquainted. But suppose you go hunting with this guy over the weekend on a hunting trip. You're going to get to know this guy and he's going to get to know you because of the interaction that is taking place in the event of doing something together and seeing how one another reacts. So this word no is a very difficult word to explain. Now, this word no in the scripture is a translation of a Greek word. And I want to read to you a, def a paragraph, short paragraph from Vine's Expository Dictionary. If you're not acquainted with that book, you ought to be. Vine's Expository Dictionary. 
And concerning this word no, listen very carefully. This word no frequently indicates a relation between the person knowing and the object known. In this respect, what is known is of value or importance to the one who knows. And hence, here's the key phrase, the establishment of a relationship. The establishment of a relationship. That is what we are seeking to have in our knowledge of Christ, a relationship, an ongoing, vital, deepening relationship with Christ. I have a very wonderful relationship with Michael. You know how it began? Some of you know. He came into the bookstore. What, 11 years ago? Uh, 13. 13. <laughs> 13 years ago. He comes into the bookstore. He says, I'm looking for a bilingual Bible. I said, what do you want a bilingual Bible for? Not many people ask for a bilingual Bible. And he told me he majored in Spanish. He'd made some missionary trips to Mexico. And when he said that, I said, we were missionaries in Mexico. What's happening? There's a relationship ever so simple at the moment. But I could, when he left the bookstore, I could say, yeah, I know Michael. But after 13 years, when he used to work part-time and came into the bookstore and learned how to wait on customers and do the finances and the many, many conversations we had in times of prayer and on and on and on and on. That relationship has been growing and deepening. And I have a unique relationship with my brother. Because of the time that we have spent and through some of the problems that we work for, work through and things that we have done together. And I treasure that relationship. But I'm saying that no, K-N-O-W, in the way it's used here, implies a relationship. The apostle is speaking of what we would have to call an experiential relationship. Now, Paul knew about Christ. He knew about his resurrection. And he had encountered the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. And yet, he said, I want to know. I want to know. And what he desired was an experiential knowledge of the things that he mentions. The sufferings, plural. Not the suffering, the sufferings, plural. What are those sufferings? Well, the, suf the suffering on the cross was redemptive. 
setting it apart as being unique. But there's a sense in which all of his sufferings were as a substitute and representative of those whom he came to save. Christ never acted as a private person. He always acted as a representative of his people. And we need to know that. And we need to think about that. And we need to be aware of that. We need to contemplate that as we think of Christ. His life, his earthly ministry. He was here for a purpose. He was the representative. He was the substitute of those who had been chosen by God in eternity past. Now, we say that, the, that Christ experienced the agonies of the cross alone because he was not only man, he was God-man, and that set him apart as being singular, and in that sense, he was alone in his sufferings. The singularity of what he experienced is expressed in these words. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That was Christ. For almost 2,000 years, now we could say 2,000, men have contemplated the sufferings of the cross and have made feeble attempts to explain its meaning. Let me broaden that a bit. How could we ever fully, fully comprehend such words as these? And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. Let those words sink down deep into your heart. Contemplate them. How could we ever fully comprehend the depth of the meaning of those words. He bore our sins in his body. Do you see now we're beginning to think in the line of his sufferings and not just casually read over that verse and say, yes, Christ died, rose again. Factual information, but see that what, what is conveyed by that. This Turn to another passage this time. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. I hope I'm opening up to you something of the process of knowing his sufferings. How could we ever unpack and fully understand and apply these words. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. Tremendous. Depth of meaning, theology, doctrine, it oozes with it. And it talks about his sufferings. Paul says, I want to know those sufferings. I don't want to know just about them. I want to enter into the, the very depth of what's being said about those sufferings. So, now the next question might be, in what sense then is it possible 
to have fellowship with the sufferings of our Lord. Well, this is going to be a little bit deep, so listen, number one, the first possibility for a Christian to enter into the sufferings of Christ has to do with what we will call sensitivity to sin. I want you to think about that. The first possibility for the Christian to enter into the sufferings of Christ has to do with what we will call sensitivity to sin. Every true child of God ought to have a sensitivity to sin. In fact, he ought to have an ever-increasing sensitivity to sin. Instead of becoming accustomed to it, or even worse, hardened to it, he should have an ever increasing sensitivity. Let me just put it in very plain language so that it bothers him and not just. Yeah, that's the way it is. Follow closely. The word, of the, God, the word of God describes the unsaved, the unregenerate man, as having become calloused. That's a description of an unregenerate man. That's in Ephesians 4.19. They have become callous, past feeling. and have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. greediness. According to this verse, the unregenerate experience no sensitivity to sin. To the contrary, they have become callous and are past feeling. If they know any remorse at all, it is only that they are sorry they got caught and not sorry that they did it. They are not grieved by their own sins, much less the sins of others. Now here's the contrast. The closer one lives into communion with God, the more sensitive he will be, not only over his own sins, but over the sins of others. Do you see how this is beginning to point us to some of the sufferings of Christ? And what caused him to suffer? The real suffering went beyond physical aspects. The real suffering had to do with the grief caused by sin. And the guilt of that sin that he took upon him the moment he was hanging on the cross. That was the real suffering. No doubt as the Son of Man looked upon men living in sin, it grieved him and caused him to suffer. The sins of others brought untold grief to the heart of the Lord because sin in its very essence is a violation of divine order. It's against it. It is totally against it. And what would Christ be for more than divine order? 
in creation and in life and in people and and sin is totally contrary to that and seeks to destroy it in every way possible. I'm going to try to illustrate this and our brother Stephen will probably appreciate it. A musician is adversely affected by discord. I was, uh, when Justin was here, I thought I would just share with him the little incident that my daughter shared with me, that, that when she's te she teaches piano, and she was teaching this little boy um, piano, and to warm up and to get ready, uh, you, you do your scales. And I'm going to carry this illustration a little bit further. Stephen, go do me a C scale on it. good, right? No problem. So that's what the little boy was supposed to do. Both hands, left, right hand, C scale up, down. But the little boy started on the wrong note in the left hand. And he played the whole scale. I want you to do that. that bothers you, that bothers me. It's terrible. It's discord. That's fine. Thank you. Now, it may not bother you, but it bothers me. Why does it bother me? Why does it bother you if you're a musician? Because you're sensitive to notes that go together and harmonize. And if I hadn't sat and listened to that scale as he's just last played it very long it would probably drive me up the wall it would make me suffer why does it make me suffer because it's wrong it's not right and my ear can hear it whether you can hear it or not now the end of the story from my daughter, so you know, was that when he finished playing it like that, and it sounded terrible, he turns to her and says, something's wrong with your piano. Not wrong, he didn't know that the wrong was him and what he was doing, but he knew it was wrong. So I'm saying that Sometimes because of who we are and what we are, we have sensitivity to certain things that bother us. They get on our nerves. They rub us the wrong way. And dear ones, sin ought to bother us. So when we move into the reality, from the reality of the natural and the physical, now to the realm of the spiritual, we are now moving into a far superior level of sensitivity. We're thinking of the infinite holy nature of our Lord. We're moving into the realm of the greatest sensitivity. Here is Christ, holy, infinitely holy, pure. He suffered because of the sins of others. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you under my wings? And you would not.
So, here's Paul talking about entering in to the sensitivity, uh, to the sufferings, rather, of Christ. What were those sufferings? I'm trying to convey to you that that sufferings of our Lord in his lifetime, not only on the cross, but in his lifetime of seeing the results of sin, the sickness, the diabolical possession of demoniacs. Sickness. Heartache. Death. Does it bother us? Really? I have the privilege of working with these men in prison. I know a lot about some of them. It's sad, it's tragic, a life wasted and destroyed in many ways. We rejoice in that there's been salvation, sins forgiven, lives are being restored. What a wonderful demonstration of God's marvelous grace. But there's some things that have happened in those men's lives that will never be recovered. Damage done that cannot be undone in the souls of others. Sin is ugly. When we think of the infinite holy nature of our Lord, we're moving into the realm of the greatest sensitivity. The very God who could not bear to look upon sin was the very God-man who was accused of eating with sinners. Surely, with even the limited understanding that you and I have of biblical truth, we should be able to comprehend at the, that the presence of sin caused our Lord great suffering. Every discord, every disproportion pierced his holy and sensitive spiritual nature. Our Lord not only suffered the physical excruciating pains of the crucifixion, he also suffered all that made it necessary for him to die on the cross. How does that apply to you and I? We have fellowship in his sufferings when sin, wherever or however it is manifested, brings grief to our soul. Dear ones, hear me well. The child of God should never find sin to be amusing or entertaining. There's a verse in Romans chapter 1, verse 32. I'm sorry, verse, yeah, verse 32. That condemns the practice of giving approval to those who practice sin. Romans 1.32, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them.
that's off limits. Let me illustrate it. When you were growing up and you disobeyed, Perhaps your parents told you, your behavior hurts me, disappoints me, grieves me. And you didn't understand that. That was beyond your comprehension. Until you have your own children. And they dishonor you, disobey you, then you know something of the hurt. When we live in blessed fellowship with our Lord, when we see men, women, young people, boys and girls being destroyed by the power of sin, we suffer. Or at least we should. In the presence of sin. One writer puts it this way. Paganism at its highest gathers its garments about it and holds sin and loathing and contempt. Christianity lays its robe aside and endures the agony in order to save the sinner. Quite a difference. That's something of what it means to enter into the fellowship of Christ's suffering. We could isolate ourselves from sinners and limit our exposure to those things that are offensive, but if we have a genuine concern over the souls of others, we're willing to suffer. Second, Major heading, the child of God may experience the fellowship of Christ's sufferings when we find ourselves in the presence of those who have a wrong concept of God and his ways. Let me read that again. The child of God may experience the fellowship of Christ's sufferings when we find ourselves in the presence of those who have a wrong concept of God and his ways. Christ was God. And because of that, he perfectly knew God the Father. This meant that Christ suffered when he was in the presence of those who manifested that they had a wrong concept of God. And they became, they became the occasions of some of Christ's most scathing remarks. Listen to these words found in Luke eleven forty two. But woe to you Pharisees. This is Christ speaking. For you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb and yet disregard justice and the love of God. What's Christ doing? Those are scathing remarks being poured out upon them by Christ himself. But what's the problem? The problem is they had a wrong concept of God. Once again, let's try to explain this on a human level. Does it not hurt us when we ourselves are misunderstood and misrepresented? Doesn't that bother you? Those who name the name of Christ and seek to walk in blessed fellowship with him ought to be greatly grieved 
when we read an article or hear a sermon that misrepresents the true and living God. That's a matter of suffering. Why does it bother you? It should. Why? Because you love God. And you don't want to hear wrong things said about God and portrayed wrongly. We live in a day when God's word is grossly misrepresented. His deity is being denied by liberals. His sovereignty is being denied by Armenians. And the Holy Spirit is being merchandised by the charismania of our day. Does that bother you? If we have any degree of sensitivity at all, such things will cause us much grief and suffering. Do we not feel grief when someone tarnishes the name of a close friend or loved one? How much more ought we to be grieved when God, our Father, is misrepresented? Christ suffered in the presence of human. Nature. Being expressed in sinful ways. And God's truth. Being perverted. He suffered. And so should we. Well time is up. We have more, but our time is up. May God help us to see a little bit of what Paul was talking about when he said, I want to know him. The power of his resurrection, his death, his sufferings, plural. Let's pray. Father, we ask now your help in uh, applying these truths in our own time, in our own life, in our own situation. And may we, Lord, know what it is, at least to some degree, to enter into your sufferings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.